Blood on the River, Chapter 4, Page 19 Travel south until your butter melts, then turn right. Old British Mariner's Axiom, How to Get to the New World February 1607 My soul nearly left my body last night. I felt it, slippery and shimmery inside the shell of my body, trying to slide out through the top of my head. But Reverend Hunt came and laid his hands on my brow to keep my soul from leaving and prayed for me to recover. And so today, my fever is broken. I am still in my body, still aboard the Susan Constant, bound for the new world. We are finally sailing. I feel the speed of the ship under me. We have left England's waters and we're heading south toward the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. Captain Newport says our route will be like a big circle, following the winds and currents. We'll sail south to the Canaries, then west to the West Indies, and then north to Virginia. To go back to England, if I ever do, we will sail still farther north and then east to England to finish the circle. Captain Newport says the fevers gripped us because we stayed so long in the fog and cold of England's winter. Now it is warmer every day. If my soul had gone out of my body, I'd have left the rolling of the ship, the stench in the closed-up tween deck, the rats that sometimes scuttle over my face in the night. I'd have left this living shoulder to shoulder with a crowd of gentlemen, each of them thinking he's better than the rest, and all of them thinking they are much better than I. But I'd also have left the chance to see the islands, and beyond them, Virginia. I'd have left my chance to dig for gold. So if it hadn't been for Reverend Hunt and his big, meaty, soul-blocking hands, last night I would have joined my mother in heaven, or my father in hell, and miss the whole exciting adventure of it. I pull on my slops and tie them at my knees and at my waist. I'm so skinny now, they nearly fall off of me. How long was I ill? Ten days? Two weeks? I wobble on unsteady legs. Air. That's what I need. Fresh air. Someone throws open the hatch. This is my chance. I pick up a slop bucket. My ticket to the ship's deck. I start up the ladder carrying the slop bucket carefully. I glance down into it. Human waste and vomit sloshing together. Bad idea. I feel woozy, almost lose my balance. Look up, I tell myself, and I do. And in a moment, my head is out of the hatch opening and I'm looking at a violet blue sky with wispy pink clouds. Sunrise at sea. Look at what the cat dragged in, a sailor calls. He's pulling on a thick line and looking down at me from the foredeck. Haven't seen this one in weeks. Thought maybe he died. Stinks bad enough down there, says another sailor. Could be a few dead ones lying behind the ale barrels. No one would even know. The sailors laugh, but I don't care. I stand, breathing in the clear, fresh air. I go to the railing, throw the contents of the bucket overboard, and then stop in utter astonishment. I stare, unbelieving. The ocean, which just a few weeks ago in England was its usual black green, has completely changed. I am looking at an ocean so clear and so blue that when a long silver fish comes to inspect what I have just tossed in, I can see the yellow stripes on his back. I linger, feeling the wind on my face. The sails are bellied out orange gold in the early morning sunlight. I feel very glad that I did not leave this adventure last night. Below with you now, a sailor yells to me. You'll be getting underfoot up here. I want to tell him I'm waiting for the mess pot for the servants, the one that James and Richard and I share with the two men who serve Master Wingfield. But I'm not sure I can make it down the ladder with the heavy pot of oatmeal. I'll wait until I'm stronger before I do that chore. Captain Newport comes strutting toward me. He has a scowl on his face, and I'm afraid he's about to whip me for loitering on deck. I scramble down the ladder, bucket in hand. Captain Newport follows me. He swings down the ladder easily, even with only one arm. I head to a dark corner of the tween deck, hoping he won't see me. But it's not me he's after. Smith! Captain Newport's baritone voice fills the tween deck. Two burly sailors come down the ladder and stand on either side of him. Sir? Captain Smith responds and stands straight and strong. Captain Newport looks angry, though I'm not sure it's Captain Smith he's angry with. By my authority as the captain of this fleet, I hereby place you under arrest. Captain Smith frowns. On what charges? He demands. 
He stares right at Master Wingfield as he says it, so I suspect he knows who has accused him of a crime. Captain Newport glances at Master Wingfield with a look of disgust. I will present the charges, says Master Wingfield. Somehow, despite the fact that we've been at sea for nearly two months, his silk doublet and velvet breeches still look relatively fresh. You are under arrest for intent to overthrow the government of this mission, murder the council members, and make yourself ruler. My mouth drops open. Wingfield, you are a liar, Captain Smith growls. And you, sir, will be hanged when we reach the West Indies, Master Wingfield says coldly. Captain Smith sputters, but no words come to him. His face and neck are red as fire. He reels back. I see his fists ball up. He's about to throw a punch. Yes, I want to shout. Smash his face in. This will be even better than watching boys or drunken sailors slug it out. I want to see blood spurt out of Master Wingfield's high-ranking nose. But in the split second before Captain Smith lets loose with his fist, it is as if something reigns him in. He hunches his shoulders, opens and closes hands, takes a deep breath. Then he turns to Captain Newport and speaks almost calmly. Captain, do you believe these charges which have been brought against me? He asks. Captain Newport looks startled, as if he didn't expect this question. I, I cannot leave a suspected traitor unshackled he says. And what if I accuse M Master Wingfield of being a traitor? Captain Smith asks. After all, it was he who wanted to turn back when we were stranded all those weeks at the Downs. It is he and his gentlemen friends who want to go back to England, to their comforts, every time there is a storm. He says the word gentleman as if it is a pile of sheep dung in the kitchen, and this makes me smile. This is how they treat their signed seven-year contracts with the Virginia Company. You have no right to accuse me, Master Wingfield shouts. You are a commoner. You cannot level charges against your betters. My betters? Captain Smith raises his eyebrows. A pig has more royal blood than you do. The sound Master Wingfield makes next is a cross between a growl and a shout. Insulting his bloodline is like throwing lie in his face. He draws his dagger and comes at Captain Smith. For a moment, all is confusion. Reverend Hunt catches Master Wingfield's arm. The two sailors step between the angry men, and Captain Newport's voice booms out. Release your weapon! Let the law handle this! Then he orders the sailors, Nelson, pull! Put Smith in irons! The two sailors hustle Captain Smith over to the chain bolts that stand ready, fastened to the wall of the tween deck, waiting to restrain a prisoner or any drunken sailor who has started a fist fight. They clamp Captain Smith's ankles and wrists into the chains. I can't believe Captain Newport is doing this. Now Master Wingfield will simply walk over and slit his throat. But when I look back at Master Wingfield, I see he is pale and shaken. He has dropped his dagger and is wiping his face with his handkerchief. Reverend Hunt has had his has ha, has his hand on his shoulder and is talking to him quietly. Master Wingfield might be a liar, but he is no murderer. Still, I have heard the gentleman whispering. In the close quarters of the tween deck, it is hard to miss much. They say Captain Smith is only an ignorant commoner, and yet he wants the power of a noble. They say he will try to take over the whole mission if he is not disposed of. They say if it were not for Captain Smith insisting they stay the course, they would be back in the comfortable homes in England by now. And I wonder how long it will be before someone else, someone who does have the heart of a murderer, slits Captain Smith's throat while he sleeps.